And I join with that choir again and I say, praise God. How many times has he lifted our heads when we thought we were done for? He is our glory and our strength. I'm glad you joined today and I'm, I'm praying that you've prepared your heart for the message. I'm going to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. But once again, I want to pray. I won't close my eyes. I won't, I won't bow my head. But this is serious business to me. This is the most important thing I ever do. This was why I was born into this world. This is why I'm standing in front of a camera and looking at you at this time. And I pray that God will not just allow me to say words that are heard with the ear, but words that grip the heart, your heart, your family's heart. So Father, I pray for a divine and spiritual understanding, something we don't have naturally, that people will hear and receive your word today. May it cause conviction where it's necessary. May it bless and edify where it's needed. And when it's over and it goes into the books of heaven, when every word I've said is registered in that place and one day I'll have to face it myself, I pray that on that day I will face it with confidence that I heard the Holy Spirit that I obeyed the Holy Spirit and that I did what you called me to do for your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Well, I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, of course, we're still talking about the virus and the pandemic and all of the ramifications of that. And, and by this time, People are getting a little more frustrated and they're tired of it and they just want to move on with life. And Sandra and I even commented on the way to church this morning, there are more cars on the road today than we've seen before. And the roads seem to be filling up and there seems to, to be more activity because there's something inside of people that just wants to get back to it. But I've also heard people say, what is going on here? What, what is happening? What does this mean? I've heard Christians ask, what is God saying to us? And that's the real question right there. Because everything that happens in this world until Jesus calls us home is to get the church ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. I've heard the comment that, well, this pandemic is the judgment of God on the wickedness of man. I don't believe that. <clears throat> I don't believe the judgment of God on the wickedness of man is coming until the church is gone. I believe God's going to, as I say, settle his debts. He's going he's to bring everybody into account for everything they've said and done. But that's during the tribulation period. That's not now. Then what is this all about? <clears throat> I believe that God is trying to get the church's attention. I believe we have grown loose and lax. I believe we border on lukewarmness. Because when Christians act surprised when difficult times happen, it shows me they're not reading the scriptures. They don't believe the scriptures. Because, because the scriptures plainly teach many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's a promise from God. Righteous people will go, go through diverse afflictions and frequent ones. Why are you surprised about anything that test your faith. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. Why are you surprised? Why are we upset that something has come that has made us terribly uncomfortable? Peter said, beloved, don't think it a strange thing as though some fiery trial is happening to you for no reason. But rejoice. So there are three scriptural references right there that remind the church, don't ever get comfortable. Don't settle down. This is not your home. 
and to make sure that we stay disconnected from this world. It is God our Father who allows chastening to come our way. Yes, God has allowed this thing, but no child of God should be surprised or upset or frustrated to the point that they want to throw up their hands and quit. We should be expecting this and we ought to be expecting more. But we also ought to be expecting God to increase our faith and grow us in grace while we're going through this. We can't be fruit-bearing, spirit-filled children of God unless our comfort is removed at times, unless we're under the rod of chastening from God sometimes. We should have expected this all along. We should have said, well, God's been good. He's been lenient for a little while, but he's getting our attention now. That's exactly what he's doing, sir. Whatever plight you're in right now, and I'm talking to my brothers and sisters in the faith, whatever plight you're in right now, it's God saying to you, take your eyes off this world and put them back on me. Get your heart away from this world and give it back to me. That's why 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, For the time has come. It's here. The time has come right now for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Do you hear me? No. Did you hear him? It's not even Peter. It's the Holy Spirit talking. Peter was just the secretary. It's time. It's come. Judgment is here. And it starts at the house of God. It starts with us believers. He is not chastening the world. He is correcting and purifying and perfecting his own church. And he says it starts with us first. This is about us. This whole thing is about the church of the living God. This whole thing reminds us we need a revival from on high. We've become far too worldly and worldly minded. We are far too entrenched in this world again. And we've allowed the world to displace fervor for Christ. For money and pleasure and things. Now I know and I'm just going to say it. I know some of you would rather flip to another channel or check with another preacher to hear a little more comfort than you're getting right now, but I'm telling you the truth. I'm speaking from God's Word. Sometimes we don't need a little comfort. We need to be reminded that this world is passing away, and we need to be often reminded that our time down here, this stint on earth, is shortly going to end. And we need to get our loins girt up, the Bible says. That's old King James. Tie up your loins and tie it up in your mind and get your mind on things that matter. And so if this judgment begins with us, why is it that we need for God to analyze us at this point in time? Here's what I believe. And I'm going to go to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, and I know that that book is almost ignored by most preachers today. They see it as allegory or it's too hard. They can't teach it. They don't understand it. And if they can't, how can the people do it? But this book says, blessed is the one who hears it and reads it and practices the things that are in it for the time is at hand. What time? The time of the coming of the Lord, the time when the end of all things is at hand And so I've come to you this day, bringing to you from the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, this warning that the Lord has placed on my heart. But I do it with love because God does it with love. And I want to start off by saying that the church has always had a problem going back. That's why the writer of the Hebrews spent all those chapters emphasizing faith because those Jewish believers were thinking about going back to Judaism. Times got hard. They couldn't take it anymore. They were being persecuted. 
And they knew if they went back to the temple and back to Judaism, they wouldn't be persecuted. They would not lose their belongings, their worldly goods. Life would be a whole lot better if they went back. It's been the church's dilemma since the church began going back. It was, it was the message and the focus of Jesus and all of the apostles and writers to remind the church that when God called Abraham, watch, he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. He didn't say you're my people and you can stay in Ur. You can do your best to stay with those people and keep your belongings. Absolutely not. God said, Abraham, you're going to be my people, but you got to get out. And don't you know that he left, he and his family left houses, goods, belongings, wealth, friends, friendship, fellowship. He left it all. There were times when Abraham and his children were out in the hot desert under tents and water was scarce at times. And don't you think for a moment they didn't think about going back if they had not already decided there's nothing to go back to. They had cut the cord. They had burned the bridges. There was nothing to go back to. That is our example today. God has saved us out of this world. He expects us to put distance between us and it. Let me use these terms again. Cut the cord, cut the ties, burn the bridges. Be done with yesterday. Be done with that and then. We are people of God and although we are strangers and pilgrims in this world and living in this tent gets hot and lonely sometimes and the world offers much more comfort than the desert does at times. But we cannot go back because we're looking for a city, looking for a place, looking for a homeland. And that means nothing to us anymore for the joy that lies before us. And for us to stay there and keep that mindset, God has to always do something to remind us we don't belong to this world. We've been called out of it and saved from it. So that's what's going on in Revelation. You get, you get to the, the back part of it, verses, or I should say chapters 17 and 18, and you see this word Babylon used a lot. Now, what is Babylon? For example, in the 17th chapter of Revelation, Babylon is a spiritual religion, a, a godless religion. It's referred to as a harlot, an adulterous woman who is clothed in purple and fine linen and pearls and she's bedecked with the finest of frocks and she's holding a golden cup in her hand and she's drunk from what she's drinking out of that cup. And the Bible specifically says, I saw the woman... <clears throat> drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So what is Babylon there? Babylon is, is, is a system. It's the religious system that I just mentioned. It's a dead, spiritless liturgy. It's denominational or organizational leaders who glory more in their positions and power they, than they do the preaching of the gospel of Jesus and submission to the Holy Spirit. It's a religious thing that emphasizes power over people rather than servanthood to the people. It's buildings. It's money. It's materialism. It's controlling people. It's begging people for their money and promising them blessings if they do so. But it's spiritually dead. It's twice dead and plucked up by the roots. It has a form of godliness and no power. And that's the condition of many churches in the world today. They are of the system of Babylon. 
But Babylon is also a commercial system, you see. It's the business of the world. It's the exchange of goods and commodities between uh, cities and uh, states and nations. It's, it's economics and merchandising and industry and marketing and trade. It's what the, the world revolves around. It's what Jesus talked about when he said in the last days they would be buying and selling and just carrying on business. You see, there's a spiritual aspect to Babylon, a dead church. There's a commercial ad, a, aspect to Babylon. It's when men love money more than life itself. It's when they will kill, they will take life for money. It's when they will stab people in the back and walk on people and lie and steal and cheat to get money. You hear me today. The system of Babylon, the commercial system of Babylon is corrupt and defiled. And it's because men love money that they, they don't even think twice about taking lives or human trafficking, stealing things from poorer, weaker people. It's a system, my friend. So in 17, it talks about a woman, a religious harlot. In 18, it talks about the commercial part of it. Let me read that. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Do you see what Babylon is? For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Yeah, her fornication. The Bible refers to Babylon as a her. It's the female gender, where it's the, whether it's the spiritual aspect of it or the commercial aspect of it. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> fornication, adultery. Everything that violates the heart of God. And the merchants <clears throat> of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Watch this. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. I find it shocking and astonishing that when God the Holy Spirit is writing this letter and he's talking about the damnation and the condemnation of Babylon, which is the world system of religion and the world system of commercialism, he stops right in the middle of it and says, come out of her, my people. How can that be? Because they have gradually gone back. They've backslidden. They've slipped back to Ur of the Chaldees. They've gone back to the world. Their affections have moved from heaven to earth. Their desires are no longer eternal and spiritual things, but things you can put in your pocket. Right in the middle of that admonition. Right when he said, see, I'm overwhelmed with this. Right when... He is condemning when angels are screaming against the sinfulness and vileness of Babylon. He says, I want my people out of there. Come out. Be done with it. Now here's something you need to understand. When spiritual Babylon and commercial Babylon have a baby, it's called politics. That's right. You see, God gave us government. The devil gave us politics. Faith is a gift from God. Politics is a work of man. And the lines have become blurred. And these days, while many of you, I'm preaching to you, I'm your pastor. While many of you would stand up and shout, I don't belong to a dead, dried up spiritual religion. 
And others of you would say, my heart is in heaven. Money is not my master. I'm not into commercial Babylon. Yet you are flirting with their child. Somehow you've gotten faith and politics mixed together. They are, dis they are dissonant. They don't belong. They are contradictory things, my friend. The faith of God does not entertain nor will it receive the politics of man. I know some of you enjoyed it right up to this point. What we fail to understand is the slyness of Satan. He knows exactly what he's doing. He can get you to go to a spirit-filled Pentecostal church where the music is great and the preaching is straight. He can cause you to say, I don't want anything from this world. But he can so entangle your mind with such political fervor until you don't realize that you are nibbling Babylon's treats. You are engaged in something that is as vile and sinful as it can be. Because when church and business begin to work together, what you have is politics and what you have is people trying to stay in power. There's nothing honest about it. Anytime you have unbelievers involved in anything, there is nothing honest about it. And that's why I believe judgment has begun at the house of God. God is saying, I am sick of the spiritual harlotry. I am sick of the dead religion. And you know something, my brother? I am too. I'm tired of hearing preachers preach fluff and nothingness. I'm tired of empty words. I get sick of hearing preachers beg for money. I'm tired of big congregations trying to be relevant and just fill up pews. It's God that is saying, my son did not die and rise again so you could build a name for yourself and preach an empty gospel, another gospel, and just fill up your pews. My son died and rose again that people might be delivered from this present evil world. That instead of going to a dead, dried up liturgical church, they could go where the Spirit of God is moving, where the, the, the sick are healed and the saved are lost, and empty people can be filled with the Spirit. And you don't have to go and yawn your way through a church listening to a preacher preach whatever, liter literature or poems, psychology. No, I'm telling you a man of God ought to preach the whole counsel of God. It's a dead church if the blood of Jesus is not being preached. It's a dead, dried up, worthless, meaningless church if the power of God is not able to operate and set the captive free. I'm telling you it is a harlot church it is a disappointment when people do it out of obligation and go to church just to soothe their conscience. Oh, you should never do that. You should go because your soul can get fed. Manna can fall down from heaven and the word of God can heal you and help you. God's tired of his people being involved in Babylon and justifying it. Commercial Babylon God's judging his church. He's calling his people away from that. You see, you can't live to make money and be filled with God's spirit and led by it. You got to choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. But we found all kinds of ways to justify materialism and the desire for riches, for things at the expense of knowing God. God is saying, stop it. Either you love me with all that you have and are, or you don't. You can't serve two masters. You will either love me with everything, or you will love the world with everything. Make up your mind. 
God is saying to those who have fallen prey to the son of adultery, that part of Babylon that is now political. Here's what God is saying. Not in my house. You don't bring that into my house. You don't mix your political views. And preachers, you don't use that kind of preaching to move people to think a certain way. The house of God is about Jesus. I make no apologies. I don't know who's squirming. I don't know who's upset. And some of you may already be trying to email me your disagreement. But I mean what I'm telling you today. Church is not for politics. It's for Jesus. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. When you go to God's house, you ought not to hear anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Coming back again. A holy life. You ought to read this book. You ought to be in a praying church, not a political church. And I tell you again, Jesus is saying to his church, not in my house, come out of her, my people. Come out of dead religion, my people. Come out of commercialism, my people. Come out of political thinking, my people. And sell out to me. Sell out soul, mind, body, spirit, strength. That's why I saved you. That's why I called Abraham out. That's why I'm calling you out. That's why I'm telling you there's nothing to go back to. And the judgment that God is sending to his house first is doing that very thing. That's why, oh, now I'm really wanting to preach. But that's why Romans 12, 1 and 2 says to you and me, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, holy, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's the least you can do. But here it is. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Don't you understand, my brother? A true child of God is not so entangled with the affairs of this life that he stays upset about the political climate or the, or the condition of a country. Instead of being upset, he will get on his knees and pray for the president and pray for the politicians and pray for the lost. Just as surely as I'm standing here, the Lord God spoke to me this morning and told me to tell you this. <clears throat> Why don't you try texting your testimony? Some of you that feel you have to text because you, you want to vent your political frustrations and you're against this side or that side. Why wouldn't you turn texting into testimony instead of texting how much you hate the president or how much you hate the Democrats. Why don't you just make your, your device a pulpit? Why not have an evangelistic crusade with your fingers and, and all of those digits? And instead of cursing, blaspheming, condemning, criticizing, and expressing your feelings, why not just tell of the goodness of God? What in this world would happen if Christians would start preaching the gospel by email and by text and by Facebook and Twitter and all of those things instead of us filling up the social media with our disgruntlement and our disagreements, why not fill it up with the blessings of God? Look what the Lord has done for me. Tell somebody where he saved you when he saved you, how he saved you. Tell somebody how good God's been since this pandemic has been in the world. Tell him how he still puts food on the table. Tell him how your brothers and sisters are still contacting you. Tell him how warm and wonderful it's been late at night when you've been alone and we've all been home with not much to do. Tell him how good it's been for your family. Instead of talking Babylon talk, instead of bantering this foolishness of the world, 
Let your mouth, let your tongue, let your fingers preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I promise you, things will turn around in your life. Jesus told me to tell you that. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to get right back on your device and express to people how bad things are and how wicked they are? When I just got through telling you that the Lord would have you get on there and tell somebody how good God has been to you and what he can do for them as well. You know my problem? Now, Sandra's sitting right here and Pastor Greg, and we got camera people and a couple of audio people and David and Jason are behind me. I'm about to get loose, and now it's time to quit. But I want to tell you something. I figured out what my problem is. I'm homesick. I'm not happy now because everything's messed up. But if everything were to go back to normal tomorrow, I wouldn't be happy then because I'm not home. This ain't my home. Did I just say ain't? This is not my home. My heart's not here. My heart's in heaven. I am so homesick for a place I've never been. Usually you get homesick if you have been somewhere and now you're away and you miss it. But I'm homesick for a place I've never been. I read about it. <clears throat> it's not the streets of gold and gates of pearl and all those angels and all those symbols and all those creatures. I don't understand that. What I'm homesick for is the presence of God. I've fallen in love with somebody I've never seen. I've only read his letters. And I sent my heart on ahead a long time ago. Sandra feels the same way. I have joy, but I'm not happy. I'll never be happy while I'm in Babylon. This is not my home. I'm encouraging you today, I hope, to let the judgment of God fix you, turn you around and awaken you to the fact that we may have become so used to Babylon that God is now saying, come out of Babylon. Don't you know you're there? Come out of her, my people. God's people will never be filled with joy until we know him only want him only until we let Babylon do its thing and we're not citizens of it. No, my citizenship is in heaven. You understand that? But pastor, you're an American citizen. That's my secondary citizenship. I got two. My primary citizenship, I got papers in glory. Hallelujah to God. And that's where I really want to be. Don't you get me wrong. My family's here, and I love my family more than I love my life. But I want to see Jesus. I've read this till my eyes have swollen. I've prayed. I've talked to him. I've said everything a human can possibly say to him over all these years. I want to see him now. I want to go where he is now. You can have Babylon. You can have dead religion. You can have the millions and the billions. I don't care. You can have your favorite politicians, your favorite actors doing all the speaking. I don't care. I'm homesick. I'm going to do what I'm doing right now until Jesus calls me home. And that's all I'm going to do. Come on, go with me. Let's leave Ur of the Chaldees. Let's leave our homes and our land and our possessions and our ties. Let's get in a tent and let's make a journey towards a, a better homeland, a heavenly country. Come on, go with me. Let's love the Lord with all our hearts, minds, souls, body, bodies, and strength. Let's get homesick for heaven together. If Jesus tarries and we all come back, 
into this building. I want us to all act like we're not going to be here much longer again. Jesus is coming. I'm homesick. Sandra, do you understand I'm homesick? You're homesick. I can't take this much more. This is not my home. I'm going to a better home. And I want you today, I'm done, I'm done. I want you today to understand that judgment, loving judgment from God comes to his house first. He's dealing with us first. I want you to understand that what you're hearing him say to the church is come out of that. That's not you. I didn't save you for that. Come out. And love me with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. <clears throat> Can I just close with this? Let me close. I meant it about that texting thing. Would you please be done with all of that? You don't know enough to text it anyway. You've just got a, an opinion. You're just echoing and parroting what you've heard other people say. <coughs> don't do that. You really have the experience to tell somebody the truth. If the blood of Jesus has saved you and cleansed you, brother, you can talk about that for a long time. First-hand experience. If God has poured blessings on you, nobody had to tell you that. You didn't have to read it. You got it from heaven. <clears throat> tell somebody about it. Let me pray with you. <clears throat> Our God and Father, you let me live to say these things to your people. May it register. May it convict us. And I pray right now that we will have a new <clears throat> or even renewed longing to know you and be done with everything else. Touch us as we text our testimonies. Let people hear and sense the true love and spirit of God as we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I love you, church. I pray for you. And if Jesus doesn't come, Join us tomorrow night at 7 o'clock for a live prayer meeting. Until then, God be with you. Day by His grace, so excuse me if I can't contain.